a tourist aspect of all of this. So I'd really like to welcome our executive director, Michael Duchesne. Thank you, Kim, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's, so I'm going to start uh, the presentation tonight with a quote from John Muir, uh, who was one of the um, strongest advocates for nature preservation in the late 19th century, uh, resident in California, but traveled all over the West, including to Glacier Park here in Montana and to Yellowstone Park as well. Um, this is John Muir on the right with Theodore Roosevelt in 1903. This is the year before Roosevelt became president. And of course, as president, Theodore Roosevelt set aside some of the largest and most prominent uh, national parks, national forests, preservation of public lands in general. So this is a quote from John Muir about national parks and tourism. And he said, quote, the tendency nowadays to wander in wilderness is delightful to see. Thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home. The wilderness is a necessity, and the mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains for timber and irrigating rivers, but also fountains of life. This is fine and natural and full of promise. So also is the growing interest in the care and preservation of forests and wild places in general, and in the half-wild parks and gardens of towns, even the scenery habit in its most artificial forms, mixed with spectacles, silliness, and Kodaks, its devotees arrayed more gorgeously than scarlet tanagers, frightening the wild game with red umbrellas, even this is encouraging and may well be regarded as a hopeful sign of the times. So, uh, remember all those family vacations that you've taken, the perennial summer excursions with your family and friends? How often were the national parks your destination? Hitting the open road on a cross-country journey to see the scenic monuments of western wonderlands is an American rite of passage. In 2015, more than 307 million people visited uh, parklands administered by the National Park Service. Of the 371 parks reporting visitation, 57 of them set new records for annual recreation visits last year. 11 parks had more than 5 million recreational visitors. Yellowstone National Park surpassed 4 million annual visitors in 2015, and Glacier Park surpassed the 100 million total recreation visits from 1910 to 2015. Both Yellowstone and Glacier rank among the top 10 for national park uh, visitation each year. These are impressive numbers for any tourist destination or attraction to covet. Oops. The National Park Service's mission is to, quote, conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. At face value, this, char this charge to conserve public lands while making them accessible as pleasuring grounds may seem absurd, self-contradictory, at variance with common sense. Today in places like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park, the millions of tourists are the single greatest threat to conservation. In the mid-19th century, however, when Americans created the first national parks, the situation on public lands was quite different. Confronted with the environmental transfiguration, sometimes devastation, wrought by urban industrialism, mining, and other extractive industries, the first park propo proponents emerged from a cadre of budding conservationists who were promoting a back-to-the-nature movement in the mid-19th century. To counterbalance urban industrialism, some writers, artists, and photographers encouraged people to view America as nature's nation. By portraying sublime scenery embodied in dramatic Western landscapes as a call to witness divine sanction of American civilization. Nature romanticism helped shape a notion of manifest destiny among many Americans who became convinced that it was God's will for the United States that, it, that the nation should stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Developmental railroad companies exploited spectacular Western scenery as symbols of manifest destiny 
to help justify construction of transcontinental railways, by preserving wilderness in the West and promoting parks as symbols of American culture, Congress created nature meccas, sacred places emphasizing the relationships between the wilderness experience, democratic values, and spiritual enlightenment to which a journey became a pilgrimage reaffirming both divine sanction and national devotion. Commanding commercial and civic interests advertised the discovery of Western wonderlands and marketed the experiences of mountain men, prospectors, and explorers to a consumer society hungry for economic opportunity and national identity. Transcontinental railway engines joined preservationists to lobby Congress for the creation of national parks because removing wilderness areas from the public domain prohibited competitors from monopolizing these spaces, while the idea of a natural territory enabled individual railroads to tie up particular parks. The principle of restoring primeval ecological relationships that is now central to wildlife management came out of the long struggle to protect wildlife in Yellowstone National Park. Indian removal, one of the offshoots of wildlife preservation, Indian removal was one of the offshoots of wildlife preservation. The federal government had to remove native peoples who were resident and sojourners in sublime wilderness areas before it could create national parks to preserve Western wonderlands as symbols of American culture. Affording public access to national parks meant government administration and policing. National park preservation went hand in hand with native dispossession. Americans had to create the idea of wilderness before they could design Western wonderlands to provide a national experience for tourists. From the very start, a debate over how much and what type of access and accommodations to provide for tourists has formed the core of the paradox of preservation and use. Guardians and commissioners let contracts to private firms to develop transportation and travel accommodations. Construction of roads and highways afforded visitors access to western wonderlands while supplying impoverished rural areas with an entry to markets for agriculture and mining products and encouraging outside merchants and service providers to capitalize on the growing tourist trade by relo relocating to small towns en route. The net result was a significant increase in populations in gateway communities just outside the developing parks. Mission 66 expanded the range of opportunities for tourists in Western Wonderlands to satisfy the demands of a prosperous and growing public. The saturation of tourist activity meant sightseers were literally crawling all over the parks. Americans began to view Western Wonderlands as being loved to death. Massive visitation exposed the paradox of preservation and use to many, leading to the rise of an environmental movement and a course change in park management. Sensitivity to environmental and aesthetic consequences of park development increased after 1963 when Interior Secretary Stuart Udall's Advisory Committee on Wildlife Management published a well-known Leopold Report. Chaired by wildlife biologist A. Starker Leopold, the board argued that increased automobile tourism, considered a salvation by Stephen Mather in 1916, now threatened preservation. The Leopold Report called for historical and archaeological research to develop new skills needed to manage natural resources. In recommending protection, protecting roadless wilderness areas from future development and urged the removal of recreational amenities that compromise park values such as golf courses, ski lifts, and motorboat marinas. As, the prim as a primary goal, quote, as a primary goal, we should recommend that the biotic associations within each park be maintained or where necessary recreated as nearly as possible in the condition that prevailed when the area was first visited by white men. A national park should represent a vignette of primitive America, close quote. The Wilderness Act of 1964 and the National Parks and Recreation Act of 1978 which led to the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act of 1980 are examples of how the Leopold Report influenced national park policy. The National Academy of Sciences published a second landmark report in 1963 calling for scientific natural resource management. Biologist William J. Robbins chaired the committee that prepared the report 
and was a principal author. The National Academy report discussed the science of managing natural systems, detailed recommendations for change, and criticized the National Park Service for, sa for failing to support science. The report advised the Park Service to create a permanent, independent, and identifiable scientific research unit with line responsibility, not simply an advisory function. Scientists encourage direct and purposeful manipulation of natural elements to nurture favored species, such as bison, bears, and game fish, and reduce populations of so-called problem species, like wolves and tree-killing insects. Fire ecology is a good example of how science, scientists and natural resource managers manipulated plant communities. Lightning, cost con, lightning caused conflagrations and fires set by native peoples played important roles in maintaining natural communities in western wonderlands. When European settlers arrived, they began to suppress fires. The Smoky Bear wildlife prevention message shows how resource managers have continued to limit fires. Natural resource managers considered fires bad. Without fire, fire-dependent plant communities began to change. To control these changes, scientists instituted prescribed fire management and restored natural fires, or as a, as a means of restoring natural fires. Despite good intentions and the tools of prescribed burn programs, wildfires continue to rage, affecting human life and property. The 1988 Yellowstone fire is one great example. Wildlife conservation is another example of purposeful manipulation evolving natural resource management for the protection and benefit of plants and animals. Some species of plants and animals became extinct because of natural causes. However, human activity and population growth have increased the danger for wildlife. The National Park Service also initiated programs to preserve and foster appreciation of cultural resources. Cultural resource management included research, treatment, protection, and interpretation. Cultural resource managers created inventories with substantive data for planning, management, proposals, land acquisition, development, interpretation, maintenance, and legal compliance. They identified and evaluated structures, archaeological resources, ethnographic resources, and museum collections. Nonprofit cooperating associations beginning with the Yosemite Museum Association in 1920, helped the, the National Park Service furnish travelers with educational and tourist information. Ranger Ansel F. Hall started the Yosemite Museum Association to raise money for a museum in Yosemite National Park. Following completion of the museum, the organization rededicated itself as the Yosemite Natural History Association and set out to satisfy an appetite among tourists for park publications. The Yosemite Association's success sparked interest in establishing non-government associations in other national parks. Unlike concessionaires, park supporters founded cooperating associations for educational purposes. Although the primary role is to enhance public knowledge and understanding, associations like the Glacier Conservancy also donated substantial support to their parks. Proceeds from the sales and other, and other association revenues help fund publications, museums, libraries, research activities, and other educational and conservation efforts. In the 1970s, cooperating associations began offering field seminars and institutes, a series of short courses in natural history, cultural history, and humanities topics, where people learned about and experienced wild nature from the perspective of science. This new type of experience again redefined the relationship between national parks and tourists committed to supporting park preservation. In the 1980s, these park proponents created new cooperating associations, funds and foundations that could raise money to augment individual park budgets to pay for projects and programs not subsidized by the federal government. By 1997, 64 cooperating associations returned $19 million in aid of national parks. In 2010, financial contributions ranged from a high, as, uh, from a high of $22.2 million for one individual park, and there were 23 friends groups donating more than $250,000 each to support individual parks. Science was not strictly limited to the purview of natural and cultural resource managers. 
for-profit companies such as Recreational Equipment Incorporated research and develop new technologies to supply outdoor enthusiasts with high-quality gear engineered for sale at reasonable prices. Catering to outdoor enthusiasts, automobile manufacturers design smaller RVs known as sport utility vehicles. Some of this seems like ancient history uh, today, but it's only really the 1980s. Uh, and these SUVs had four-wheel drive and were used to carry passengers and cargo into remote wilderness camps. The increasing popularity of backpacking in the 1960s and 1970s led people into ever more remote places. Modern tents, sleeping bags, hiking boots, and other gear engineered with synthetic fibers to be strong, fireproof, waterproof, well ventilated and lightweight, allowed campers to go almost anywhere. New technology corporations fashioned backpacks and clothing sturdy enough to withstand hard wear and weather extremes. Campers learned how to purify water using hand pump filtration systems and to prepare a great variety of freeze dried and other f new foods with the help of portable stoves and insulated coolers. The National Park Service developed backcountry trails and campsites to accommodate these groups. Today, concern is rising over how to ease the ecological strain of millions of hikers and backpackers on the backcountry regions of national parks. In spite of Yellowstone National Park reaching uh, all-time highs in visitation, the wildlife in Yellowstone slowly began returning to native habitats. The grizzly population threatened with extinction rebounded. Yellowstone bison, the nation's only free-ranging bison herd, struggled but survived. The gray wolf was reintroduced in 1994. Some tourists learned respect for wildlife. They stopped feeding and interfering with the animals and remembered the best way to see park animals was from a distance. In 1958, the National Park Service stopped the long-standing policy of stocking Yellowstone waters. They halted the artificial propagation of fish, of fish at the Yellowstone Lake hatchery and limited the catch. The National Park Service began promoting fishing for fun, introducing the notion of using barbless hooks and returning uninjured fish to the water. Today, the National Park Service requires permits to fish in Yellowstone. They designate some areas as fly fishing only. Recently, the National Park Service has uncovered a new threat in the presence of non-native lake trout. These fish are posing a serious threat to the native Yellowstone cutthroat trout. The phenomenal success of skiing became a major worry for conservationists in the 1940s as resort operators trying to lengthen their season and enlarge their clientele about new ski resorts near wilderness areas. And this is Walt Disney promoting his ski resort in Mineral King, which is a, a valley in Sequoia National Park, very deep into the range of the mountains. And there's Mount Disney. Thank goodness this was never established. Uh, the project was squashed uh, by the Sierra Club and others advocating against it. Uh, but there was almost a Disney park in the midst of uh, the Sequoia National Park. The National Park Service began to limit group sizes and require permits for overnight trips with pack and saddle stock. Horse riding tourists camping with pack or saddle stock had to stay in designated backcountry campsites. They were responsible for monitoring their stock to keep animals from grazing. Riders staked the horses and mules at least 300 feet from the water sources and vegetation whenever possible. To prevent the spread of exotic plant species, Permits in the 1990s required riders to feed, to use feed pellets for 48 hours in advance of and during a trip and to pack out any leftover feed and manure. Only 900 tourists traveled the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon in 1964, jumping to 16,400 in 1972. Pollution caused by tourists led to outbreaks of dysentery along the river. In addition, pot hunting tourists raided archaeological sites and vandalized canyon walls. To preserve canyon ecology, the National Park Service had to limit the number of people on river trips down the Colorado. About 23,000 people now make this trip annually. In the late 1960s, the Yosemite Park and Curry Company established its own climbing school. Today, climbing in Yosemite through, through involving only a fraction, although involving only a fraction of visitors, has achieved a status placed, placing it on par with other activities.
And this is a famous group of climbers in Yosemite Park. There's a, there's a whole climbing culture that's emerged there uh, as they've just finished climbing El Capitan, which is one of the most dramatic wall faces in 1975. They're, they're breaking at the top of, of, the, uh, of the wall. The Bob Marshall, one of the best places, one of the last best places in the last best place. Um, in the recent 20th century, viewing sublime scenery in Western wonderlands gave way to outdoor recreation in America's playgrounds. By the 1960s, the paradox of trying to maintain national parks as natural nature preserves for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people came fully into view. Preservation advocates demanded that National Park Service limit recreational access and make room among the RVs for natural habitats and ecosystems. As scientists learned more about the natural environment, terms like ecology entered the lexicon. Concern for continued environmental degradation, air and water pollution, and the loss of plant and animal species made Yosemite, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Glacier National Parks important laboratories for understanding earth sciences. Simultaneously, the diffusion of new technologies and products began to intensify recreational experiences. These new roles forced Americans to rethink their relationship with national, what their relationship with national parks was and what it might become. As Americans looked toward a future Concerns about the quality of tourism experiences and local ecology have prompted a careful study of current problems. The National Park Service publishes their results in general management plans and other documents. These tomes, some, these tomes give park administrators and federal government and the federal government and taxpayers a chance to see what the future might look like. National Park Service needs to maintain our national parks as places of tremendous beauty peace and scenic grandeur, and places of natural and cultural significance. Natural resource managers need a greater knowledge and appreciation of the intricacies of ecosystems. Air quality, especially during peak tourist seasons, needs more careful monitoring, as do noise levels. We must find public support for alternative forms of transportation within the parks. Simultaneously, the, Na the National Park Service needs to improve the visitor experiences. All interpretive and educational themes need to represent the most appropriate locations and methods to educate visitors who have diverse interests and backgrounds. To preserve the cultural landscape, resource managers can adopt some historic buildings for reuse. The National Park Service also needs to work closely with local American Indian tribes, many of whom consider parts of the parks as sacred. So far, park management has disappointed many Native Americans. Concessionaires played a vital role in developing the infrastructure of tourism, both inside and outside all national parks. Tourists need gas, food, and lodging, as well as souvenirs and supplies. They seek out amusements of all types, in trying to maximize their own profits while providing for the needs of tourists and at the same time meet the National Park Service demands for a specific type of visitor experience. Concessionaires have often struggled through the use of private means to achieve public ends. As automobile tourism rapidly expanded beginning in the 1950s, new facilities like motels, restaurants, gas stations, and souvenir shops sprang up in small towns on the fringes of national parks. Residents of these gateway communities make their livelihood serving the multitudes of tourists passing through each season. They depend on the national parks to serve as attractions for tourists, much as the National Park Service has come to depend on gateway communities to siphon off many of the visitors who the parks themselves cannot satisfy. As gateway communities continue to grow, they bring the perils of urbanization to the doorstep of our most cherished natural preserves. An accelerating transformation of the United States from a rural to an urban-based nation has swelled the appreciation for national parks. After decades of tourist promotion, Western wonderlands reached a saturation point. Persistent trends and tourist habits have deteriorated the quality of the national park experience. Increasingly, preservationists have tried to capitalize on this awareness by educating visitors about the process 
the processes of biological resource management. They have promoted a new type of tourist, the eco-tourist. Eco-tourists are politically active, savvy about the science of, te- of ecology, and reliant upon nuclear age technology. As John Muir's forests and wild places in general become more like the half wild parks and gardens of towns, eco-tourists become the next generation to experience the scenery habit in its most artificial forms. Tourism in America's Western wonderlands has been evolving since the 1850s, and it can continue to do so. From scenery to science illustrates how Americans have compromised park preservation to satisfy a desire to commune with nature. As such, the history of preservation and use in these federal preserves reflects the soul and the spirit of our nation. Investigating decisions our predecessors made concerning management of preservation and tourism in Western wonderlands reveals the evolution of a complex interaction between American interests and values. Choices that we make today and in the future will help define American character and the quality of life that we and our descendants experience in the 21st century. Direct physical contact with wilderness is at the heart of the American preservation efforts, so tourism, perhaps more than any other factor, will determine what the qualities of experience will be. We will have to balance the preservation and tourism in the national parks if we are to prove John Muir was right when he regarded the scenery habit as a hopeful sign of the times. Thank you so much. You are such a patient and great audience.